On the next episode of Painting and Travel with Roger and Sarah Bansimer, prepare to get wet as Sarah takes a most unusual boat ride. Then sit back and watch Roger paint as they visit a colorful antique boat show in the small town of Tavares, Florida. Today we're in Tavares, Florida. It's north of Orlando a little bit, in the center of the state. It's a small town here, and we're right on Lake Dora. And we're here because the Sunnyland Antique Boat Festival on Lake Dora is taking place this weekend. And it's about getting to be about sunset now, but today we had a fabulous time looking at some of the boats. And Sarah's going to show you a few of those boats in a few minutes, but I didn't want to paint in the bright sunlight today, and besides, it was very busy all day. So I came down here a little bit earlier, and I sketched this boat over here. And I'm going to try and do a small painting. Today I'm using acrylics. I'm using a small uh, variety of brushes, mainly flats, pointed brush, and a fan brush. It doesn't really matter what kind of brushes I'm using. The main thing is to get some good brushes, not some old beat-up brushes, although they have their place too. But I always try and start out with some nice brushes, with some nice chisel points on them. It's important for me to get a nice painting, especially if I want to get some nice sharp edges. So we're painting this boat over here. I've changed my composition quite a bit from what I'm looking at here because I have to simplify things. And I only have a very short time period here too. I'm using acrylics. I'm using very limited palette right now. It's white, ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, burnt umber, and Indian yellow. I can add more colors later if I want, but I just uh, really want to get everything blocked in, so I'll, I'll get started here. I always try and start with a, a large brush to get things covered, and here's another, my little atomizer, so this will keep my paints wet. This is one of the most important things I have in my paint kit. Just a little spray atomizer. And as I sat here earlier, sketching this boat, there are a number of issues that uh, always come up when painting boats like this. And frankly, they're not easy to draw. Getting the right perspective on a boat is always a problem if you've ever tried to do that. You know what I'm talking about. But one little trick I use, I learned a long time ago, I'm not sure from where, but it always seems to work on helping me get the right perspective, the, light, the right lines on a boat. And, and here's what I do. I start with a figure eight, and I just make a figure eight just like this. And really, no matter what perspective I use or what vantage point I choose, this figure eight usually helps me to get these lines on the boat. It would almost seem logical to make the drawing from the stern to the bow with just sweeping lines like this. But if I make the figure eight, it gives me this grace, it gives me this flow of line that I couldn't get just by making the lines on the sides of the boat. Here are a few paintings I've done in the past, and you can see better what I'm trying to describe with these figure eight lines. When it comes to the stern, sometimes the figure eight needs to be sliced off a bit, but this method always gives me the flow I need for creating what is called the shear line on any ship or boat. And on a long boat like this, I can just make an elongated figure eight. Here's the stern, here's the bow. Oh, it seems like we're going to run out of sunlight. It's really enjoyable to paint this time of day, but there are some disadvantages because the sun changes so quickly. But I think more can be learned by painting outside than actually painting in the studio, especially painting boats like this. I know I've painted boats from photographs before, 
and if there's one boat behind another boat, it gets very confusing as to what lines, what ropes and, and uh, rigging belongs to which boat. So painting on location, you can always walk over there, check it out, and really visualize and see more clearly how the boat is structured. Now I wish I were closer to this boat because I could get a lot more accuracy in it. And as things move back like this, the perspective flattens out. If I were closer, I would see more perspective. If things in the distance, everything sort of just gets, you know, horizontal. And that's what's happening with this boat here. So it would have been better if I were closer to it, but that's just not possible. So you have to sort of always work with what you have. I've also changed the composition here to suit me a little bit. There are some nice large trees over to my left, and I'm going to put those in here. Of course, I can't see them right on this dock, but so I'm changing the composition. I'm using this composition more as an inspiration. I want to give some distance right here with these trees that I'm inventing. I'm not really putting them in. There are trees way back here that I can see them. But as I said, I'm going to change this composition a little bit just to suit myself. But I'm using everything I see here as a guide, as a key. I'm getting inspiration from what I'm looking at. I'm, tr I'm not really inventing anything. I'm just sort of rearranging things on my painting. This water seems to be very gray. And it's really a ref a reflection of the sky for the most part. Say, for instance, I wanted to change this sky and make it into a sunset. If I did that, we'll make this sky sort of a, a warmish, yellowish red color. If I did that, then as you can see, the, the water doesn't look natural at all because every all these colors relate so closely to each other. They all affect each other so much. So when this sky is is a warm color up here, the rest of these colors down here look false. So all the colors have to uh, harmonize with each other. Now if I took this warm sky and I brought it all the way down, it's like putting on a pair of sunglasses. Now the whole thing looks natural again. So I can't, if I were to make a sunset painting, I couldn't just make a sky that was a sunset. I'd have to make the entire painting relate to what the sky is, is telling me. There are so many beautiful boats here today. And earlier, Sarah interviewed the chairman of the event. And I think while I just lay in a few more of these colors, we'll uh, go over there and we'll show you what happened earlier on in the day. I'm with the chairman of the Sunnyland Antique Boat Festival. This is Terry Feist, and I've had so much fun walking around this morning. I've seen boats and cars and a number of different uh, elements here. Well, we have an incredible show here. This is our uh, 22nd annual event. We usually have somewhere around 275 to 280 individual boats here. So They look so beautiful. Most of them are wooden. I guess that's what makes them an antique. That, that is correct, yes. Uh, we. we uh, Obviously, we're just like a car club, only we're, all, we're into wood boats. So we have all the contingents of wood boats here. We have a lot of what we call classic boats. We have antique boats. We have a couple boats here, like old canoes, are over 100 years old. And uh, we try to put them in different categories here. So uh, we have several of the vintage mahogany boats in the water. Uh, we have the uh, Antique Outboard Motor Club here from Central Florida, and they have a huge, beautiful display of uh, beautiful antique uh, motors, antique outboard motors. We have a, a pretty good size uh, nautical flea market here. We have like 85 vendors. And there's odds and ends here, and you might just find the missing piece that you've been looking for for years, like maybe this. And then we have these uh, amphicars that come in here that uh, they have their annual convention. In An amphicar? An amphicar. The amphicars were made in Germany, and uh, they were made in Germany in the 60s, and they're still uh, around, and you'll see about 10 of them here on Saturday. So no seat belts. Okay. Just latch the door, and that's it. If we get strange. <laughs> Should not do 
Well, after you get in the water, don't open the door. Okay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> very comfortable and I'm not seasick. <laughs> it's smooth, nice breeze. That's about the roughest water we'd go out in and close to shore. It wouldn't go very far like this because you'd be drenched in 10 minutes. But... Yeah. So how, how high are our seas here? <laughs> oh, I guess it's about a foot and a half, but it's kind of windy so we get spray off the water like that. Yes. <laughs> And when we get back on shore, you just pull the plug and drain out any... Well, we've got an electric pump that pumps it out of the back, actually, so... Oh, a real bilge pump. Yeah, exactly. It's a boat, too. Everything uh, that a car has in it, it also has that a boat would have. Uh, it seems to work nicely. It's really captured the imagination of the Americans. It just uh, came at a nice time in the 60s where the sky was the limit for what you could do. I guess so, when it started and then it kind of ended badly and they weren't able to sell them all. So when we get up to the ramp, we're going to put the wheels back in gear and the propellers are going to push us up and then the wheels will catch and uh, we'll be up on the ramp like a car again. Well, we've converted back to being a car, and we're going five or ten miles an hour, and it feels very smooth. Once it's nice and warm here. Yeah, it's lovely. Ken, you're my favorite driver <laughs> and pilot. It was revenge with class. What? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's really nice to have a real Barbie on board. I don't usually hug, hug my guests, but it was just really a meaningful trip. Thank you so much. We come back through Louisiana. Give me a call. We'll go do something in Louisiana. Will do. Look forward to it. Until next time. Good. Nice to meet you, folks. Thanks. See you around. Does anyone from overseas attend? This year, every year we feature a certain boat here, and this year mm -hmm. we're featuring Riva boats, and Riva boats were made in Italy. I can take you from here and I'll show you some. We've got some beautiful boats on display. So I see there are several Riva boats docked here, and um, it's just stunning. The Italians always have such a wonderful well, this design is, this element. Is, this happens to be a 1960 Ariston boat right here. This looks uh, very fancy. This is a 1959 uh, Riva called the uh, Florida Super. It's a little bit smaller boat. It's not quite as expensive. It's not the big high dollar end boat like the Alaska that we looked at. So it's kind of a middle of the road boat, a little, a little less expensive boat, but still a very desirable boat. Um, Terry, do you have a boat here? Uh, yes. Could you give us an up-close look oh, at I'd it? Oh, like, I'd like to show it to you. Terry, is this gorgeous boat yours? Uh, yes, this is uh, my boat here. This is a uh, 1955 Chris Craft 21-foot Cobra. This boat was in an accident, and uh, it had been banged up pretty bad, so I bought it, and I ended up restoring it all, getting it all back to originals. It's a rare boat. It was only made one year, 1955. They made 108 of these boats. This is probably the most desirable collector boat built after World War II. It looks like a lot of fun. What does this uh, special fin well, do? This is the, what's very unique about this is this is fiberglass. Mm -hmm. And fiberglass was just starting to be uh, invented around uh, that period of time. So this is Chris Craft's first experiment with fiberglass. This hatch cover here and that fin. The rest of the boat's all wood, but this is a takeoff and, and start of the fiberglass era. This boat, when it was built new and in the showroom floor, it didn't sell. 
and the reason it didn't sell is because it only had one seat in it, and and, and people would not buy it because the quote it was a snobbish boat, and and back in the mid 50s, you know, it was all about families and mm -hmm. and you know coming out of the Korean War and everything, and the boats mm -hmm. that were made were all representative of family boats. Well, Terry, thank you very much for showing me your beautiful boat, and I uh, hope to see you in the water in it at some point. Well, thank you, and I, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to tell you all about it. Thank You're you very, very much. Kind, it's yeah. my pleasure. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I see you are a model boat maker. We are professional model builders, yes. Oh, how interesting. And these are some of your tools? Yes. People bring in a picture of their favorite boat and you... Yes. Well, what we mainly do is commission work. We do models of people's specific boats. We do work for naval architects. We do work for corporations. How did you learn how to uh, do this? Because this is quite a... I'm mainly self-taught. My great uncle was a model maker for Mystic Seaport. Oh, really? And I, I learned a lot of things from him. You have to have quite an eye just to be able to duplicate correctly. <laughs> yes, and I do a lot of computer work to, in, in the building of it and the designing. So you're an artist? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and a technician. I always like to keep a painting, it's like a juggling act, I like to keep a painting going all at once. I don't like to finish one area and then move on to another area and finish another area. I kind of like to finish it all at once. But I do like to lock in these big areas first, so I'll take my largest brush here, some Indian yellow and uh, burnt sienna. Make this dark green down here. Before I go any further, this is a handy item to always have is a digital camera. So before things change any further, I'll take a couple pictures, including a close-up of the boat. That way I'll have some reference photos when I get back to the studio. There's some beautiful sunlight on that hull of that boat now. So I think uh, I never use pure white. Well, I shouldn't say I never use pure white, but I only use, use pure white as sort of as, a, as the last maybe touch on a canvas to put a nice highlight on there. So even though that hull is, is about as white as anything can get right now, I'm going to warm it up with a little bit of yellow because I don't want that to be pure white, not yet. So I'll mix a little bit of yellow and I guess I'll just pick up a little bit of burnt umber in that, just to gray it down just a little bit. And then later I'll go in and I'll put some pure white on top of that, just for a highlight or two. Now, as I said here earlier, I made a fairly accurate drawing of this. If I'm doing a landscape 
painting, I wouldn't uh, draw it with a pencil, but in this case, I wanted to get it as accurate as I could. So I sat here for maybe 15 minutes or so and, and made this drawing. We have a train in the background here. And it uh, goes back and forth from this town to Mount Dora. And they often have a, um, a dinner train too. So there's a lot of nice things to do around this area. We have a canoe right out here called a dragon canoe, I think. You might be enjoying seeing me struggle with this because this is uh, this has been a struggle. I think I'm fighting against the sun here going down. I know it's just about to go down behind the trees right now. We've had a lot of distractions and that sort of thing. So uh, I don't see much reflection on this water down here. The water is very choppy. It would be nice if it were very calm, but it's not. Oh, beautiful little Egret just landed in front of us there. Let me grab a photograph of this while that bird is still there. He may work his way into this painting, maybe back in my studio. And I have a big collection of photographs that I've taken over the years of birds and that sort of thing. So just seeing that bird land here, maybe it'll give me the idea back in the studio to, and since I've taken a photograph of him, maybe I can place a bird in here and, and work with that. Maybe, maybe not, but that's always a possibility. I've done a lot of paintings of boats and a lot of paintings of antique boats, and uh, I can show you a few of those now if, you, if you'd like. I'm just these are, uh, these are some classic boats that I've seen from other boat shows in the past. And those were all painted from photographs, so I had a lot more time to sit in the studio and sort of contemplate what I was working on. Well, this painting hasn't gone the way I wanted it to, so if you've had the same thing happen to you, don't feel bad because painting on location is just really, di really difficult. You can learn a lot by being on location like this, but it comes with a, a set of problems that you just can't even imagine until you get out here and, and paint on location. The light changes, there's all sorts of uh, just, you know, interruptions. Uh, but I, can t I, I think I can take this painting back to the studio, and thanks to my digital photograph, I, I'll be able to work on this, and we'll just see if I can pull this painting through. So one way or the other, I'm gonna make this painting happen. <laughs> I guess this is a good lesson. I, you know, I know it happens to me every once in a while, and it's especially difficult because I'm not only sitting here dealing with the elements I'm trying to talk. If I could just concentrate and focus on this, I would have an easier time of it. it it's such a beautiful boat, you know, I, I don't want to, I, I can't let it go to waste. Well, you know, the, the light is just behind the trees now. We've got the sun on that boat. It's just such a beautiful scene, isn't it? So if anything can be learned here today, it's just a lesson in perseverance. I love the sky now. The sky, is, the sky just changes all the time. And I think it's difficult for any artist to paint on location and see what he thinks is, or, he or she thinks is just, just the perfect scenario for a subject. And then 10 minutes later, it's totally changed. So what, what do you do? Do you try and remember what you saw 10 minutes ago or when it changes to something better, do you try and jump in and change it to that? It's one thing for certain, I, I can't keep up with it. And at some point during any painting, the scene itself has to be abandoned and the concentration has to be just on the painting itself. Since that sun is just bouncing around, I, Earlier in the day, I saw a nice little patch of sunlight out here. Let me just put that in. Like I said, whether I, so when I, when I work on this painting again, I want to concentrate 
on this painting. I want to want to see this boat, and I want to feel that sky, uh, and I want to feel that the the sky is reflected in the water. I want to feel that the reflections on the side of this boat are, uh, you know, have some of the blue sky in it because it's bouncing off the water. I want the trees maybe to reflect some of the blue sky, and maybe some of this green will reflect in the water. It all has to sort of work like this, all to work together. So it's almost dark now. We're losing the light totally. It's behind the trees. Uh, this has been an ordeal, I'll tell you, out here, but we'll pull this through, whether it's sitting here tomorrow working on it a little more or back in the studio. We'll uh, work on it some more, but right for now, it's getting a little chilly, and uh, I think it's about time for supper. What do you think, Sarah? I'm starved. Okay, let's go. how I get through any of these paintings, frankly. <laughs> For more information about painting and travel with Roger,